Okay. All right, so we're gathered uh, to finish this essay that we began two weeks ago by Percy Shelley on a, a defense. I say in defense, but it's actually a defense of poetry. I went through a little bit of a, an introduction, 10 minutes or so, just to give people the context, which if you're watching this on YouTube, you can go back to the link in, in the description box and watch uh, last week's um, reading, where I, I just go through a little bit of why did Shelley write this? So under, under what conditions was this written? What was the world uh, being shaped by in 1819 as this was occurring? What were the political conditions of totalitarianism, fascism in Europe post-Congress of Vienna of 1815 that really saw a complete shutdown of creative liberties, the idea of creative mentation, insurrectionary type of literature, art, um, music even, was censored uh, massively all across Europe um, in the wake of the Napoleonic uh, Wars. So Shelley was one of the few who had the courage to take a stand. There's many works that he wrote that were not published in his lifetime, this being one of them. This was written 20 years after he died, a very mysterious death at the age of 30 at sea. Um, a little bit after his very close friend and associate, uh, John Keats, had died as well under less mysterious, but still shady circumstances uh, at the age of 26. Um, the issue of the role of the poet and what is poetry per se is obviously challenged. Uh, people were at the time uh, being induced to believe that poetry was just designed to sensually titillate, maybe give you a, a bit of an, an excursion away from reality, but uh, it was treated as something romantic and banal which was not something worth doing ultimately because we were now in the industrial age, right? That had just awoken a few decades earlier. And the idea was, or being promoted that we should all learn just useful utilitarian skills, um, study law, economics, um, maybe even philosophy is more useful than poetry, said a lot of the, uh, the British East India Company economists like Thomas Peacock, who was uh, the person Shelley was responding to who said, no, Poetry is for the, the obsolete age of the past when people were had the liberty to be dreamers before the, the Industrial Revolution, and, and Shelley took offense. So he broadened the definition of poetry as we began reading through the first half of this, this essay to mean something much more than simply lyrical rhyming words. Um, he, uh, it, it, it touched on every single aspect of the human condition that involved the need to express a creative flexibility to leap beyond our limits whether it was in painting, whether it was in dance, even whether it wasn't, you could include everything. And he's uh, ultimately making the case that poetry is the most important uh, faculty to develop that must lead all other sciences, including mathematics, physics, chemistry, politics is what we're, we're also exploring here um, in order to give humanity the vitality to always rejuvenate itself, renew itself in the form of constant renaissances as a way of being. So that's really the, the challenge that was put forth by Plato a lot earlier, thousands of 2000 years earlier. How do we create a society which is capable of constant renewal and not falling into crystallization of um, some suffocating formal structure of governance that would always destroy ultimately the, the obligation of the individual to express their sovereign creative freedom, right? So how do you, how do, you do that? So I'll do a little bit of a, a screen share um, and then we can just read if people want to stop at any point, we'll stop, but otherwise, you know, it's a pretty, it's not too challenging to read. So we'll just read through, I think for the most part, and then we'll have this, a dialogue discussion afterwards. Uh, let me just figure out how to make this bigger. Um, who can remind me what page we ended on? Page 12, the second paragraph. Page what? Page 11, second paragraph. No, we're on some, you, we're using different uh, standards here. Yes. Uh, oh, I think maybe I don't have the same uh, uh, version than yours. Maybe uh, mine. Um, I yeah. think this is the one we were using as the, the work. I think we made it all the way up till 60 something. Um, yeah. We were speaking of the Romans last time. Okay. Okay. Uh, we're talking, I'm seeing Romans here. He's talking about Rome a lot. So let's just go back a little bit more. 
Yeah. I like this. And you have uh, uh, try to find Kuya Karan Vate Sakro because they don't have the sacred bard. Hmm. I saw uh, on your uh, down on that little uh, slider down there. It said a uh, page sixty one at the end. It said so, sixty one. Okay. Yeah. So here's what I'd like to do. I'm gonna. I'm. Gonna, I. I think we should overlap because it's been two weeks and. Um, yeah, my mind is a little bit fuzzy. So I think that here is a good place to start on page 43 in this little book we're using, which is on the slider page 50, um, where he's beginning now, he's looked at some of the bright upshifts of self-knowledge of growth and, um, and the positive changes in human civilization. But now we're going to look at some of the periods of decay of social life. Um, and he's going to take a look back at tragedy and, and Rome. So um and maybe some mediocre, some mediocre poetry in Rome as well. Um, so let's pick a reader. Maybe we'll do two readers, uh, one for 40 or so minutes, the next one for the second 40 minute uh, piece until we end. Uh, who would like to start? I can. You do it. All right. You want me to pick up uh, on, uh, but in the periods of decay? Yeah, let me actually see. Maybe I can make this actually. Let me try one thing here. Ooh, what did I do? Did I do this right? Feels so. easier to follow. Hey, Kevin. <laughs> there we are. Hey, guys. Hey. Hello, and and little little. Is that Ryland behind you? I I can't see the, the face. All right. Hey, Ryland. Yeah. Ryland just got home. Hey, cool. Emily and Courtney are off to the side here. Oh, okay. Hey, guys. All right, so yeah, let's go for this. Um, so yeah, in periods of the decay. All right. But in periods of the decay of social life, the drama sympathies, uh, sympathizes with that decay. Tragedy becomes a cold imitation of the form of the great masterpieces of antiquity, divested of all harmonious accompaniment of the kindred arts, and often, and often the very form misunderstood or a weak attempt to teach certain doctrine, which uh, uh, doctrines, which the writer considers as moral truths, and which are usually no more than the spacious flatteries of some gross vice or weakness with which the author, in common with his auditors, are infected. Hence, what has been called the classical and domestic. Uh, hence, what has been called the classical and domestic drama. Addison's uh, uh, Cato is a specimen of, of the one, and would, it, uh, and would it were not superfluous to cite examples of the other. To such purposes, poetry cannot be made uh, subservient. Poetry is a sword of lightning, ever, ever unsheathed, which consumes the scabbard that would contain it. And thus we observe that all dramatic writings of this nature are unimaginative in a singular degree. They affect sentiment and passion, which, divested of imagination are other, are other names for caprice and appetite. The period in our own history of the, gr of the grossest denigration of drama is in the reign of Charles II, when all forms in which poetry had been accustomed to be expressed became hymns to the triumph of kingly power over liberty and virtue. Milton stood alone illuminating an age unworthy of him. At such periods, the calculating principle pervades all the forms of dramatic exposition, ex exhibition, and poetry ceases to be expressed upon them. Comedy loses its ideal universality, which succeeds to humor. We laugh from self-complacency and triumph instead of pleasure. Uh, malignity, sarcasm, and contempt succeed to sympathetic, uh, sympathetic merriment. We hardly laugh, but we smile. Obscenity, which is ever blasphemy against the divine beauty of, in life, becomes, from the very veil which it assumes, more active if less disgusting. It is a monster for which corruption of society forever brings forth new food, which it devours in secret. The drama being that form under which a, a greater number of, mo of modes of expression of poetry are susceptible of being combined than any other. The connection of poetry and social good is more observable in the drama than in whatever other form. And it is indisputable 
that the highest perfection of human society has ever corresponded with the highest dramatic excellence and that the corruption or the extinction of the drama in a nation where it has once flourished is a mark of a corruption of manners and an extinction of the energies which sustain the soul of social life. But as Machiavelli says of political institutions, that life may be preserved and renewed if men should arise capable of bringing back the drama to its principles. And this is true with respect to poetry in its most extended sense. All language, institution and form require not only to be produced, but to be sustained. The office and character of a poet uh, participates in the divine nature as regards, the prov regards providence, no less, less than as regards creation. Civil war, the spoils of Asia, and the fatal predominance first of the Macedonian and then of the Roman arms were so, uh, were so many symbols of the extinction or suspicion of the creative faculty in Greece. Uh, it's suspension of the creative faculty. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Extinction or suspension of the creative faculty in Greece. The bucolic writers who found patronage under the lettered tyrants of Sicily and Egypt were the latest representatives of its most glorious reign. Their poetry is intensely melodious, like the odor of the, of the tubros. It overcomes and sickens the spirit with excess, uh, with excess of sweetness. Whilst the poetry of the preceding age was as a meadow, uh, a meadow gale of June, which uh, mingles the fragrance of all the flowers of the field and adds a quickening and har harmonizing spirit of its own, which endows the sense with the power of sustaining its extreme delight. The bucolic and erotic delicacy in, in written poetry is coral, uh, correlative with that softness in statuary, music, and the kindred arts, and even in manners and inst institutions, which distinguish the epoch to which I now refer. Nor is it the po uh, poetical faculty itself or any misapplication of it to which this want of harmony is to be imputed. An equal sense to the sensibility to the influence of the senses and the affections is to be found in the writings of Homer and Sophocles. The former, especially, has clothed sensual and pathetic images with irresistible attractions. Their superiority over these succeeding writers consists in the presence of those thoughts which belong to the inner faculties of our nature not in the absence of those which are connected with the external. Their incomparable perfection consists in a harmony of the union of all. It is not what the erotic poets have, but what they, do, and they have not, in which their imperfection consists. It is not in as much as they were poets, but in as much as they were not poets, that they can be considered with any plausibility as connected with the corruption of their age. Had that corruption availed so as to extinguish in them the sensibility to pleasure, passion, and natural scenery, which is imputed to them as an imperfection, the last triumph of evil would have been achieved. For the end of social corruption is to destroy all sensibility to pleasure, and therefore it is corruption. It begins at the imagination and the intellect as at the core and distributes itself thence as a paralyzing venom through the affections in, into the very uh, appetites until all become a torpid mass in which hardly sense survives. At the approach of such a period, poetry ever addresses itself to those faculties which are the last to be destroyed and its voice is heard like the footsteps of Astere departing from the world. Poetry ever communicates all the pleasure which men are capable of receiving. It is ever still in the light of life, the source of whatever of beautiful or generous or true 
can, ha can have place in an evil time. It will readily be confessed that those among the luxurious citizens of Syracuse and Alexandria, who were delighted with the poems of Theocritus, were less, uh, were less cold, cruel, and sensual than the remnant of their tribe. But corruption must utterly have destroyed the fabric of human society before poetry can ever cease. The sacred links of that chain have never been entirely just disjointed, which descending through the midst of many men is attached to, the, to those great minds, whence is from a magnet the invisible effluent, effluence is sent forth, which at once connects and, and, and animates and sustains the life of all. It is the faculty which contains within itself the seeds at once for its own and, and of social renovation. And let us not circumscribe the effects of the bubolic and erotic poetry within the limits of sensibility of those to whom it was addressed. They may have perceived the beauty of those immortal compositions simply as fragments and isolated portions. Those who are more finely organized or born in, are, uh, and born in a happier age may recognize them as episodes to that great poem, which all poets, like the cooperating thoughts of one great mind, had built up since the beginning of the world. The same revolutions within a narrow sphere had place in ancient Rome, but the actions and forms of its social life never seemed to have been perfectly saturated with the poetical element. The Romans appear to have, treasure, have considered the Greeks as the selectest treasuries of the selectest forms of manners and of nature, and to have abstained from creating in measured language, sculpture, music, or architecture, anything which might bear a particular relation to their own condition, whilst it should bear a general one to the universal constitution of the world. But we judge from partial evidence, and we judge perhaps, uh, perhaps partially. Aeneas, Vero, Pacuvius, and uh, Accius, uh, all, uh, all great poets have been lost. The, Lucrentius is, is in the highest, and Virgil, in a very high sense, a creator. The chosen delicacy of, expression, of expressions of the latter are as, the, as a mist of light which conceal from us the intense and exceeding truth of his conceptions of nature. Livy is instinct, is instinct within poetry, yet Horace, Catullus, uh, Ovid, and, general, uh, and generally the other great writers of the Virgilian age saw man and nature in the mirror of Greece. The institutions also, and the religion of Rome, were less poetical than those of Greece, as the shadow is less vivid than the substance. Hence, poetry in Rome seemed to follow, rather than accompany, the perfection of political and domestic society. The true poetry of Rome lived in its institutions, for whatever of beautiful, true, and majestic they contained it could have sprung only from the faculty which creates the order in which they consist. The life of Camillus, the death of Regulus, the expectation of the senators in their godlike state, of the victory of the victorious Gauls, the refusal of the Republic to make peace with Hannibal after the Battle of Cannae, were not the consequences of a refined calculation of the probable personal advantage to result from such a rhythm and order in the, shadow, in the shows of life. To those who are at once the poets and the actors of these immortal dramas. The imagination beholding the beauty of this order created it, it out of itself according to its own idea. The consequence was empire and the reward ever living fame. These things are not, are not the less poetry Quia caerant vate sacero. They are, uh, uh, they are the episodes of that cyclic poem written by time upon the memories of men. 
The past, like an inspired rhapsodist, fills the theater of everlasting generations with their harmony. Just quick, uh, Quan, um, I think your Latin's okay. What, what is quia carent vate sacro mean? Sacred? It means because they don't have the sacred poet. Mm. Okay. Uh, what what it means that because the Roman don't have the natural endowed poet by language by speaking uh, compared to the Greeks, their their poem are their, their institutions, the political institutions. Right, that's what we we're talking about last week. Right. Hmm. All right. And uh, we uh, we we just stopped here last week, uh, two weeks ago. Perfect. So would Solon be a reference point there? Well, he, he would actually be the thing that Rome was lacking in terms of somebody who was both an institution builder, but also a poet, since he wrote his constitution in the form of a poem. Yeah. Well, Rome herself was the poem when she was uh, shining. Yeah. Uh, in the first part of empire, let's say, between 200 BC and 27 BC, and later on with spots of shining moments. I don't know. Everything I've been looking at so far shows me a lot. I mean, we, we could talk about that. I saw some beauty in before they destroyed Carthage. There was there was some some poetic beauty in their institutions for a few hundred my, years. My God. After the empire, it just looks <laughs> uglier and uglier. Matt, I don't want to mock you, but if you won Rome before the conquest of Carthage, you won a village. No, you not at all. They had Rome. an alliance with Carthage for 300 years. They were working together as, as allies against the Persian Empire and against uh, a lot of evil. I think that uh, would be a very long conversation that we wouldn't have one day, Matt, because I don't want to take times for the reading today. Okay. <laughs> I remember, Quan, you also had a quote you pointed out last time. I think it was at the end here. Uh, what quote? Uh, I, yeah, I, I can't quite remember. That's why I was, uh, I was asking. Yes. Uh, oh, no, no, no. I, I was not quoting something. I was reading three times uh, the last line. They are the episodes of the cyclic poem written by time upon the memories of man. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, I was carried away by that uh, poetical line. <laughs> All right. I'm disappointed, Declan, that you were not excited when you read <laughs> that uh, line. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll try to be next time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So at length, the ancient system of uh, religion and manners have fulfilled the circle of its revolutions. And the world would have fallen into utter anarchy and darkness, but that there were found poets among the authors of, of the Christian and ch chivalric systems of manners and religion, who created forms of opinion and action never before conceived, which copied into the imaginations of men became as generals to the bewildered armies of their thoughts. It is foreign to the present purpose to touch upon the evil, uh, evil produced by these systems, except that we protest on the ground of the principles already established that no portion of it can be attributed to the poetry they contained. It is probable that the poetry of Moses, Job, David, Solomon, and Isaiah have produced a great effect upon the mind of Jesus and his disciples. The scattered fragments preserved to us by the biographers of this extraordinary person are all instinct with the most vivid poetry. But his doctrines seem to have been quickly distorted. At a certain period after the, pre uh, the prevalence of a system of opinions founded upon those promulgated by him, the three forms into which Plato had distributed the faculties of mind, underwent a sort of apotheosis? Apotheosis. Apotheosis. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, a divine elevation. Okay. Apotheosis, all right. 
and became the object of the worship of the civilized world. Here it is to be confessed that light seems to thicken and the crow makes wing to the rocky wo uh, rookie, uh, wood. Good things of day begin to droop and drowse and night's black agents to their praise do rouse. But mark how beautiful an order has sprung from the dust and blood of this fierce chaos. How the world, as from the resurrection, balancing itself on the golden wings of knowledge and of hope, have reassumed its yet unwearied flight into the heaven of time. Listen to the music, unheard by outward ears, which is as a, a ceaseless and invisible wind, nourishing its everlasting course with strength and swiftness. The poetry and the doctrines of Jesus Christ and the methodology and, and institutions of the Celtic conquerors of the Roman Empire outlived the darkness and the convulsions connected with their growth and victory and blended themselves in a new fabric of manners and opinion. It is an error to impute the ignorance of the dark ages to the Christian doctrine and uh, doctrines or the predominance of the Celtic nations. Whatever of evil their agencies may have contained sprung from the extinction of then the poetical principle connected with the progress of despotism and superstition. Men, from causes too intricate to be here discussed, had become insensible and selfish. Their own will had become feeble, and yet they were, and they were its slaves. Well, I lost my spot. Oh, and thence. Oh, yeah, there. And, th and thence the slaves of the will of, uh, the will of others. Lust, fear, av avarice, cruelty, and fraud characterized a race amongst whom no one was to be found capable of creating in form, language, or institution. The moral anomalies of such a state of society are not justly to be charged upon any class of events immediately connected with them. And those events are most entitled uh, to our approbation, which could dissolve it most ex ex expeditiously. It is unfortunate for those who cannot distinguish words from thoughts that many of these anomalies have been incorporated into our popular religion. It was not the effect of the 11th century that the effects until the 11th century that the effects of the poetry of the Christian and chivalric systems began to manifest themselves. The principle of equality had been discovered and applied by Plato in his Republic as the, th the theoretical rule of the mode in which the materials of pleasure and of power produced by common skill and labor of human beings ought to be distributed among them. The limitations of this rule were asserted by him to be determined only by the sensibility of each or the, util or the utility to result, uh, to result to all. Plato, following the doctrines of Timaeus and Pythagoras, taught also a moral and intellectual system of doctrine, comprehending at once the past, the present, and the future condition of man. Jesus Christ divulged the sacred and, in, ex, in, and inter, eternal truths contained in these views to mankind. And, and, and Christianity, in its abstract purity, became the uh, ex, exotric expression of the isotric doctrines of, uh, of the poetry and wisdom of antiquity. The incorporation of the Celtic nations with the exhausted population of the South impressed upon it the figure of the, po of the poetry existing in their uh, mythology and institutions. The result was a sum of the, uh, of the action and reaction of all the causes included in it. For it may be assumed as a maxim that no nation or religion can supersede any other without incorporating into itself a portion of that which it supersedes. The abolition of personal and domestic slavery and the, and the emancipation of women from, uh, from a great part of the degrading restraints of antiquity were among the consequences of these events. The abolition of 
personal slavery is the basis of the highest political hope that it can enter into and the mind of a man to conceive. The freedom of women produced uh, the poetry of sexual love. Love became a religion, the idols of whose worship were ever present. It was as if the statue of Apollo and the muses had been endowed with life and motion and had walked forth among their worshipers so that earth became peopled with the inhabitants of a diviner world. The familiar appearance and proceedings of life became wonderful and heavenly and a paradise was created out of the, uh, as out of the wreck of Eden. And as this creation itself was poetry, so its creators were poets and language was the instrument of their art. Galetio fu il libro e... This isn't Latin, is it? Yeah, it's, la <coughs> it's Italian. Oh, okay. That, that makes more sense. Dave, yeah. Dave can you uh, translate that one? Yeah. It means, uh, and the, the, the guy who wrote the book was a pander. A pander is an old word meaning someone indulging in base of pleasure. Ah. It's okay. from Dante. Oh. Very good, Quan. Very impressive. So... That's, uh, no. Juan, do you speak Italian? Un poco. Uh, what is Galeetto? Is that a person? Hmm? Yes. Galeetto? Yes. yes. Wow. Well, he was the book who wrote uh, it. Like, yeah. The, the, he, the guy who wrote the book. Yeah. Uh -huh. No, Galeetto means the pander. And the, the, the guy who a pan, a a the, a pander. the guy who wrote the book is a pander, P A D R, and it's an old word for someone indulging in base pleasures. Uh, a wanton, okay, in modern world, a wanton. Really? Okay, look at you. Wow. The uh, the yeah, pro no, that's, uh, from Dante's uh, Commedia. It's uh, taken from Dante. Yeah, but uh, I'm not capable to say where exactly. Must be in inferno when we speak of pandering. Probably fair enough. Okay, I think right. we're to go. Okay, so the the provincial tro. Treviers or inventors preceded Petrarch, who, who, whose verses are as, uh, are as spells, which unseal the inmost enchanted fountain of the delight, which is in, in the grief of love. It is impossible to feel them without becoming a portion of that beauty which we can contemplate. It were superfluous to explain how the gentleness and the elevation of mind connected with these sacred emotions can render men more amiable, more generous and wise, and lift them out of the dull vapors of the men, of the little world it's, uh, of self. Dante understood the secret of uh, the secret things of love even more than Petrarch. His Vita in, in nu Nuova is an inexhaustible fountain of purity, of sentiment and language. It is the idealized history of that period and those intervals of his life which were dedicated in it, and those intervals of his life which were dedicated to love. His apotheosis of Beatrice in paradise and the, gradu and the gra gradation of his own love and her loveliness, and by which, as in by steps, he feigns himself to have ascended to the throne of supreme cause of the supreme cause, is the most glorious imagination of modern poetry. The acutest critics have justly reversed the judgment of, uh, of the vulgar and the order of the great act of the divine drama in the measure of, uh, of the uh, admiration which they accord to the hell 
purgatory, and paradise. The latter is a perpetual hymn of everlasting love. Love, which found a worthy poet in Plato alone of, the, of all the ancients, has been celebrated by a chorus of the greatest writers of the renovated, re, re, renovated world. And the music has <laughs> penetrated the, the caverns of society and its echoes still, uh, still drown the uh, dis, uh, dissonance of arms and superstition. At successive intervals, uh, Aristo, Tasso, Shakespeare, Spencer, uh, Cauldron, Ra Rastello, R Russo. Russo, and the great writers of our own age have celebrated the dominion of love, planting as it were trophies in the human mind of that sublimest victory over sensuality and force. The true relation born to each other by the sexes into which humankind is distributed has become less misunderstood. And if the error uh, which uh, confounded diversity with inequality of the powers of the two sexes has been partially recognized in the opinions and institutions of modern Europe, we owe this great benefit to the worship of, the, of which chivalry was the law and poets the prophets. That was interesting. Hmm. The poetry of Dante may be considered as the bridge thrown over the stream of time, which unites the modern and ancient world. The distorted notions of invisible things which Dante and his rival Milton have idealized are merely the mask and the mantle in which these great poets walk through, and it walk through eternity, enveloped and disguised. Mm. It is difficult. It is a difficult question to determine how far they were uh, they were conscious of the distinction which must have sub uh, subsisted in their minds between their own creeds and that of the people uh, of the people. Dante, at least, appears to wish to mar uh, to mark the full extent of it by placing uh, uh, Rufinius, who um, Virgil... I think it's Rufeus? Rufeus? Yes, no. Yeah. Rufeus, whom Virgil calls Justinus uh, 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 Unus in paradise, and observing a, a most heretical caprice in his distribution of rewards and punishments. Just quick question. Anybody who's read Dante here, uh, do they know to what he is referring regarding the placing of this character in paradise, which is apparently a controversial thing? Okay. Mental note. We'll look at it and uh, Google later. Okay. <laughs> All right. And Milton's poem contains within itself a philosophical refutation of that system of which by a strange and natural an an antithesis, it has been a chief and popular support. Nothing can exceed the energy and magnificence of the character of Satan as expressed in Paradise Lost. It is a mistake to suppose that he could ever have been intended for the popular uh, personification of evil. In uh, implacable hate, patient cunning, and a sleepless refinement of device, to inflict the extremest anguish on an enemy. These things are evil. And although venial in a, in a slave are not to be forgiven in a tyrant, although redeemed by much that ennobles his defeat in one, in, in one subdued, are marked by all that dishonors his conquest in the victor. Milton's devil as a moral being is as far superior to his God as one who, uh, uh, per perseveres in some purpose which he has con conceived to be excellent in spite of adversity and torture is to, uh, is to one who in cold uh, security of undoubted triumph inflicts the most horrible revenge upon his enemy, not from any mistaken notion of inducing him to repent of a, of a perseverance in enmity, but with the alleged design of exasperating him to deserve new torments. Milton has so far violated the popular creed, if this shall be judged to be a violation, as to have alleged no superiority of moral 
virtue to his God over his devil. And this bold neglect of the direct moral purpose is in the most of, uh, decisive proof of the supremacy of Milton's genius. He mingled, as it were, the elements of human nature as colors upon a single palette and arranged them in, in the composition of his great picture according to the laws of epic truth, that is, according to the, uh, to the laws that, uh, of that principle by which a series of actions of the eternal un external un uh, universe and of intelligent and ethical beings is calculated to excite the sympathy of su uh, succeeding generations of mankind. The Divina Commedia and Paradise Lost have conferred upon modern mythology a, a systematic form. And one change in time shall have added uh, one more superstition to the mass of those which have arisen and decayed upon the earth. Commentators will be lear uh, learnedly employed in uh, elucidating uh, the, uh, the religion of ancestral Europe only not uh, utterly forgotten because it will have been stamped with the eternity of genius. Homer was the first and Dante the second epic poet, that is the second poet, the series of whose creation bore a defined and intelligible relation to the knowledge and sentiment and religion of the age in which he lived and of the ages which followed it, developing itself in correspondence with their development. For Lucretius has uh, limed the wings of his swift spirit in the dregs of the sensible world. And Virgil, with a modesty that ill became his genius, had affected uh, the fame of an, Im of an imitator. Even whilst he created anew all that he copied and none, um, and none among the flock of mock uh, birds, though their notes were sweet, uh, a pa a Apollonius, Rhodius, Quintus, uh, Caliber, Nonus, Lucan, says Statius, or uh, Claudian, have uh, sought even to fulfill a single condition of epic truth. Milton was the third epic poet. For if the title of epic in, in its highest sense uh, be refuted to the Aeneid, Still less can it be con uh, con conceded to the Orlando Pericio, the Gerusalme uh, Lib uh, Liberata, the Luciad, or the Fairy Queen. Dante and Milton were both deeply penetra penetrated with the ancient religion of the civilized world, and its spirit exists in their poetry probably in the same proportion as its forms survive in the, in the unreformed worship of modern Europe. The, uh, the one preceded and the other followed uh, the Reformation at almost equal intervals. Dante was the first religious reformer and Luther surpassed him rather in, in the rudeness and acrimony than in the boldness of his censure of papal us usur usurp usurpation. That's a tough one, yeah. You got it. <laughs> Dante was the, first, uh, uh, was the first awakener of entraced Europe. He created a language in itself music and persuasion out of the chaos of, in of inharmonious barbarism. He was uh, the congregator of those great spirits who proceeded over the resurrection of learning, the Lucifer of that starry flock, which in the 13th century shone forth from uh, Republican Italy as from a heaven into the darkness of the, of the benighted world. His very words are instinct with spirit. Each is as a spark, a burning axiom, yet in, in, in extinguishable, uh, of inextinguishable thought and many yet lie covered in the ashes of their birth and pregnant with the lightning, which has yet found no conductor. All high poetry is infinite. It is uh, as uh, the first acorn, which contained all oak, uh, oaks potentiality, uh, all oaks potentially. 
and veil after veil may be undrawn and the inmost naked beauty of the meaning never exposed. A great poem is a fountain for, forever overflowing with the waters of wisdom and delight. And after one person and one age is exhausted all its divine effluent, effluence, which their peculiar <clears throat> relations enable them to share, another and yet another succeeds and new relations are ever developed, the source of an unforeseen and unconceived delight. Well, do you, does anybody, uh, do you want to take a break, Declan, and uh, pass yeah. the torch? Cool. Yeah. If there's any, was... uh, before we, we go to the next speaker, does anybody have a, a thought or a question or anything? Or we're, we're all pretty okay so far with the flow? That, that little last part kind of made me think of, uh, you, you think, hey, we, we sometimes complain about how there's no new, uh, no really good books nowadays or something like that. Yeah. And, and partly you can think of it, it's because they haven't had time to be sifted out from all the bad ones. We still have all the bad ones. You never hear about all the bad, bad, bad books back in Homer's time because nobody cared for them. Right. That's a good point. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's this very, uh, very beautiful line where uh, he says, all high poetry is infinite. It is as the first acorn, which contained all oaks potentially. I thought that was really cool. I, it, it just, I never thought of it like that. It's, but it's, it's, yeah. You know, when you think about it, mm -hmm. wow. So much potential, huh? The first one has all of them. In well, it. I guess that's it. Yeah. Like what's the common denominator amongst all of the, this highest caliber of poetry that he's zeroing in on that has this eternal uh, quality about it. Which, which is the gem that Declan was talking about that, that is the thing that perseveres despite all of the, the popular crap that coexisted with it that is sort of like sifted away like wheat mm -hmm. from chafe. Um, yeah. So what is the common denominator that sort of like moves through all of it um, must have that characteristic of this, the same, the same sort of analogy you could see from that, that seed of an oak because forever there will always be, that'll always spark uh, similar great creative ideas. <laughs> To be yeah. born. you can see it like as a fibonacci uh series going forward but also going backwards you know to the primeval mm. um yeah the 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 first archetype right and uh it's like in music you know with all this great music going back quoting past composers mm. you look at uh, beethoven and mozart quoting bach Oh, I see yeah, what you mean. I was yeah. thinking of Shakespeare uh, just in the sense or, you know, in the idea of how do we know something will will last beyond its age, right? There's many different, some people say, oh, well, we need time, right? We need history to uh, confirm to us yes and no. I mean, Ro uh, Robert Frost once said, you know, you can tell that, you know, a great poem is great from the moment you've read it. You know, you don't need time to go on. But why is that? Or, you know, if we're to qualify or quantify, you know, what what is required? I mean, one could argue something like Homer or Shakespeare. It becomes more true over time just by virtue of the fact that it was written so long ago and yet it's still relevant. And the more that time goes on, the fact that it's still relevant, uh, regardless even when all the, you know, familiar circumstances have changed, you know, we're not going to like uh, ritual sacrifices for the gods and, you know, putting on our armor and, and going to fight bad guys or like a neighboring town. Uh, but yet the virtues and the ideas that are there, they're just as valid, even though all those, uh, you know, the material conditions have changed. So in a mm -hmm. sense, it's, it becomes more true over time or it's, just by the fact that so much time has, has gone on and it's still resonant. Hmm. Yeah, I had a thought on that point too, but I know Jonathan, you, you, when we're doing the small group thing, uh, it's not like when we're doing lectures, you could just jump right in rudely okay. and that's cool. It's totally appropriate. <laughs> yeah, I, I, some just um, caught me on page 56 where it spoke about um, the, the state, the extinction of the poetical principle and its connection to the progress of um, 
how it was connected to the progress of despotism and superstition. Oh, yeah. But it also drew um, reference to the, the, the will of man and his selfishness and feebleness and being a slave to fear and cruelty and fraud and so forth and so forth. And it also said the moral anomalies of such a state of society are not justly to be charged upon any class of events immediately connected with them. And the last line, it is unfortunate for those who cannot distinguish words from thoughts. And many of these anomalies have been incorporated into our popular religion. And I mean, I, I don't want to come off as a non-Westerner, -Western, even though I live, I live in Trinidad and Tobago, but um, how we see it, the Western world has made popular religion wokeness or even some might even go further to say cultural Marxism or whatever, but you could see that this whole woke political correctness is a form of religion. And it really, it ties in fully to all these because no one has principles, the moral principle, well, I shouldn't say no one. There's a lack of moral principles for the will of man to stand for the things that they believe would build culture, build society. And that popular religion that mentioned there kind of seems similar to what we experience in today with whole political correctness as a religion. And in page 61, it spoke about the, rel the relationship between the sexes and chivalry as a form of law during that time. Mm -hmm. And it draws reference to appreciating the difference between the sexes but today in, in Western culture, we're trying to make it equal and, and dwindle the emphasis that each sex play in the whole formation of culture, you know, in terms of roles and responsibilities and how they guide culture towards. So it seems that the whole decline of poetry, which today we could see in popular music, uh, not really much meaning or words of words or anything, is similar to what is being said here in, in those two pages. Mm. That's my contribution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in that, in that sense, somebody might go and blame the music, you know, and, and the art of our society and, and actually cast false blame on the music itself or on poetry and music as being like, well, look, the society is obviously decaying. It's losing its everyone's morality is turning to jelly and and look what the music that they they're enjoying so it must be the fault of the music and this is what Shelley's also sort of getting across I, I liked what, what he said that it is the cause of the imper imperfection of poetry is not found in what it has but what it lacks so it's to the degree that it is actually not poetry that the thing we're calling poetry is accompanying the decay of that society so yeah that's a very interesting idea that would I think offend a lot of politically correct uh woke woke people to say that no it's actually they're they're not it's not music like you think it's art but it's it's actually it's not art to the degree that's not art that's that's why you you are what you are <laughs> as a degenerate <laughs> you know participating yeah. in the destruction of your world yeah dave wrote a good piece up on this yeah that's right yeah and and maybe 10 lines just above the line that jonathan just quoted that uh, for those who cannot distinguish words from thoughts, if you go 10 lines above that line, you have uh, from the extinction of the poetical principle. Okay, so uh, exactly what uh, you guys just said, that's the extinction of the poetical principle, meaning the capacity to see with the three forms of beauty, goodness, and truth. Because once again, it's the problem of the hen, of the chicken, and of the eggs, okay? Uh, is, the, is the degenerate poetry poetry? No, it's not poetry because it's devoid of the poetical principle. And poetical principle precisely, and uh, I often argue by etymology, uh, poetry come from poesis, meaning creation or creativity. So if it's uh, if there's the extinction of the poetical principle, another way to say it is the extinction of the capacity for creation, for creativity. And 
the capacity to see the truth. And from that, uh, you can uh, receive all kinds of BS and not be uh, capable to see it very fast and very clearly as being BS. Absolutely. I'm pretty sure Dave is going to want to say something on this, but on that point too, I was just thinking about, because he was also saying like, I, I pity or whatever, those who cannot distinguish words from thoughts. And it's like, well, what is the poetic principle? Like, what is that principle in a poem or in a piece of art that defines it as, as what we just said, right? That this thing that we're hunting down. And it's this open versus closed system idea because a, 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 an, a word, if you start just thinking that truth is located in the word or in the symbol that's being used, then it's a closed system, right? It's like all it is is crystallized. There's no place for the mind to look for anything beyond what you physically are seeing. But if you're looking always for this, if you're sensitive to look for with a context, what is the higher um, idea that you could only access from like looking at things allegorically, you know, you're, you're able to sort of see the ambiguity and, and, and look at things from the standpoint of metaphor so that your mind is always in a state where it's, it's seeking and moving, not just like holding onto something and like getting static. Then the, the poem has within it sort of that open system quality. It can, it can spawn or <laughs> inspire new ideas rather than undermine any future good ideas from, from growing. I like the idea of um, gaps, you know, because you have the nominal definition of everything, right? So you have that kind of formal structure where you can, you know, define what everything is ostensibly saying, but where's the, where's the like new thing? You know, why are you writing the poem if you're just saying what's already uh, known or what you could just say? So in this sense, the poetry is really in the gaps it's in the ambiguities and the nuances that force uh that compel new degrees of meaning right they open up new areas of thought and so it's it's these small deviations that are actually uh the poetic because they kind of force the mind into new places and so the great poets are always uh bending the language and creating new gaps in the mind that people kind of have to find some way to wrestle with and, and fill in. There, there's a, absolutely there. Pascal once blew my mind uh, during a lecture he gave like 12 years ago. And uh, I'm going to see if I could find this painting. Cause it's like, uh, that's yeah. sort of the, th here it is. I think piece of meat, piece of meat. <laughs> it's a Rembrandt painting and uh 12 years ago oh my god it was like 2006 yeah. I remember that really blew my mind I was just like come by the office and you're doing this presentation <laughs> and uh that was like me because I have like an art background I didn't really have a poetry poetry background but that's how I sort of resonated to this for the first time and, and based on what Dave just said it got me thinking about you know like the literal imagery of like photorealistic painting why is that inferior because a lot of people can paint something that looks almost like a photograph but it's inferior to something like what Rembrandt would do, who also paints. He could paint things photo with a photographic reality to it, but it's not it's not art if it's if that's all it is. If you could just take a, a snapshot, it's it's not art. So there's something that looks really weird. You're like, why is this piece of art, uh, uh, the meat, <laughs> hanging <laughs> behind a butcher shop that Rembrandt did? That's good. Why is that art? What is about that? Is it about the meat? And I remember Pascal just like asked this to, to the audience. And I was like, what the hell kind of bizarre question is this? That's, that's really doesn't seem like very edifying. So what is this painting about? What, what, is, what do you think Rembrandt is actually trying to communicate? Right. So I can make it bigger. I can't make it bigger, damn it. Let's see, I'm going to try to make it bigger. There it is. I made it bigger. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Hmm. What's, what's he actually communicating there? What does, he, what does he want us to take away? There's a face behind there. Didn't notice that initially. Yeah. That's an anomaly. I, I, no. <laughs> no, but I, I, I would raise an answer in the uh, 
poetical dimension. He wants us to be present to that moment of life. Well, I could. I think you're you're right, and I think you're both right in in the sense that Declan's nose, your your nose for anomalies, definitely works because it's like nobody sees that face at first. You're just standing. It's a big painting, and you can imagine people just being befuddled. Right? He knows that his audience is going to be standing there for a while, kind of confused because <laughs> that's an abnormal painting. And then at a certain point, he knows that the mind is going to catch the anomaly. <laughs> and what's that, what's that face doing? Is it looking at the meat or what's it looking at? What's that woman looking at? Looks like it's looking at you. <laughs> yeah, she's looking at you. So actually, you know, in, in that context, standing there, what's the, what's the actual subject of the painting? Is it the meat? Is the face? Or is it something else? That's not in the painting. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it's you. The audience, you are the top, you are the top, you are the topic of the painting. He's actually getting you to become, like like Quan just said, self-aware and actually thinking a little bit about your, you know, you're not just a spectator. We're not just voyeurs looking at something. We're both voyeur, we're looking at, but we're participating in a process. And it's that gap, right? Like Dave was saying, there's always these like in poetry, there's these gaps of the mind, these singularities that give the mind a chance to like get poked. <laughs> You're like that didn't fit. Yeah. 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 Thank yeah. you, Pascal. Very good one. Yeah, that's that's that's, uh, that's great. Rembrandt has this uh, in in uh, in a lot of painting, you know, not, not just that one, but uh, Rembrandt has a way to get you to uh, self reflect, which is great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Velasquez too, love his stuff. Hmm. It's always and but, but uh, yeah, but in Rembrandt, I I find like this this question of the light and the shadows mm -hmm. is more present, it's more clear. Mm -hmm. Like you know, what what, and uh, it kind of brings you to to the you know understanding of what what is hidden, but in plain sight. At the same time. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Good one. Yeah, we. So let's, uh, I'm, I'm positive we can finish this beautiful little essay. Um, who would like to, uh, Dave or Pascal or Quan, who would like to pick it up? Who feels? Uh, I'll try. Yeah, Jonathan? All right, here, uh, Jonathan. Uh, yes. Okay, I can hear you. I can hear pretty well. Okay, go for it. Just one, two, three, one more time. Good there. It's good. It's just, I find it's like faint, a low decibel level. Is there any way to... I'd, I'll just speak a little louder. Ooh, yeah, that's, that's good. That's good stuff. Okay. Right. Uh, page 67, right? I'll just read from the web browser. Uh, just the age. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the age succeeding. All right. The age succeeding to that of Dante, Petrarch, and Boccaccio was characterized characterized by a revival of painting, sculpture, and architecture. Chaucer caught the sacred inspiration and the superstructure of English literature. And the superstructure of English literature is based upon the materials of Italian invention. But let us not be betrayed from a defense into a critical theory, cr critical history of poetry and its influence on society. Be it enough to have pointed out the effects of poets in the large and true sense of the word upon their own and all succeeding times. Both, but poets have been challenged to resign the civic crown to reasoners and mechanists in, on another plea. It is admitted that the exercise of the imagination is most delightful, but it is alleged that 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 of reason is more useful. Let us examine as the grounds of this distinction, what is here meant by utility, pleasure or good in a general sense is that which the consciousness of a sensitive and intelligent being seeks and in which when found it acquiesces. There are two kinds of pleasure, one durable, universal and permanent 
the other transitory and particular. Utility may either express the means of producing the former or the latter. In the former sense, whatever strengthens and purifies the affections enlarges the imagination and adds spirit to sense. It is useful. But a narrower meaning may be assigned to the word utility, confining it to express that which banishes the importunity of the wants of our animal nature, the surrounding men with security of life, the dispersing and grosser delusions of superstition, and the conciliating and the conciliating such a degree of mutual forbearance among men as may consist with the motives of personal advantage. Undoubtedly, the promoters of utility in this limited sense have their appointed office in society. They follow the footsteps of poets and copy the sketches of their creations into the book of common life. They make space and give time. They Exertions are of the highest value, so long as they confine their administration of the concerns of the inferior powers of our nature within the limits due to the superior ones. But whilst the skeptic destroys gross superstitions, let him spare to deface, as some of the French writers have defaced, the eternal truths characterized upon the imaginations of men. Whilst the mechanist abridges the, and the political economist combines labor, let them beware that their speculations for want of correspondence with those first principles which belong to the imagination do not tend, as they have in modern England, to exasperate at, one, at once the extremes of luxury and want. They have exemplified the saying, to him that hath more shall be given, and from him that hath not, the little that he hath shall be taken away. The rich have become richer, and the poor have become poorer, and the vessel of the state is driven between the Scylla and Carib Caribdis, Chari of anarchy and despotism. Such are the effects which must ever flow from an unmitigated exercise of the calculating faculty. It is difficult to define pleasure in its highest sense, the definition involving a number of apparent paradoxes. For from an inexplicable defect of harmony in the constitution of human nature, the pain of the inferior is frequently connected with the pleasures of the superior portions of our being. Sorrow, terror, anguish, despair itself are often the chosen expressions of an approximation to the highest good. Our sympathy in tragic fiction depends on this principle. Tragedy delights by affording a shadow of the pleasure which exists in pain. This is the source also of the melancholy, which is inseparable from the sweetest melody. The pleasure that is in sorrow is sweeter than the pleasure of pleasure itself. And hence the saying, it is better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of mirth. Anybody kind of confused about that should just listen to Mozart's Requiem and it'll become clear what he's talking about. Not that this highest species of pleasure is necessarily linked with pain. The, the delight of love and friendship, the ec ecstasy of the admiration of nature, the joy of the perception, and still more of the creation of poetry is often wholly unalloyed. The production and assurance of pleasure in this highest sense is true utility. Those who produce and preserve this pleasure are poets or poetical philosophers. The exertions of Locke, Hume, Gibbon, Voltaire, and Rousseau, and their disciples in favor of oppressed 
and deluded humanity are entitled to the gratitude of mankind. Yet it is easy to calculate the degree of mortal and intellectual improvement which the world would have exhibited had they never lived. A little more nonsense would have been talked for a century or two, and perhaps a few more men, women, and children burnt as heretics. We might not at this moment have, have been congratulating each other on the abolition of the Inquisition of Spain, but uh, it exceeds- Quick here, uh, yeah. he's got a little footnote. I think it was him who wrote that, Shelley. Uh, although Rousseau has been thus classed, he was essentially a poet. The other is even Voltaire. Sorry, did I say Voltaire? Although Rousseau has been thus classed, he was essentially a poet. The others, even Voltaire, were mere reasoners. Um, what, do you, what do you think of that one, Quan? Wow. <laughs> well. I just see you laughing. It's eh? <laughs> yeah, it's not an easy one because Voltaire... He's pretty funny. He's a sarcastic, was a sarcastic guy, okay? Uh, he was much more something of a socialite compared to Rousseau. And Rousseau, yes, his persona, okay? His persona evokes much more a poet living in the eternal dimension rather than Voltaire, who was very uh, skillful in in social life, okay? But I think it's a bit unfair just because Voltaire was quite skillful in social life to remove his greatness as a writer and a, also a kind of poet. But definitely, if I have to choose, I choose Rousseau because uh, I was truly what, a little bit uh, clumsy in social in social life, but uh, definitely living in the eternal dimension. Mm. But you can be both. You can be skillful in social life and be a poet too. Mm. I, th I just thought it was funny how he said, as, as, as great as they were, it's, uh, how do you word it? Uh, it is easy to calculate the degree of moral and intellectual improvement which the world would have exhibited had they never have lived. <laughs> I just thought that that was kind of funny. Um, but it exceeds. But it exceeds all imagination to conceive what would have been the moral condition of the world if neither Dante, Petrarch, Boccaccio, um, Chaucer, Shakespeare, Calderon, Lord Bacon, nor Milton had ever existed. If Raphael and Michelangelo had never been born, if the Hebrew poetry had never been translated, if a revival of the study of Greek literature had never taken place, if no monuments of ancient sculpture had been handed down to us, and if the poetry of the religion of the ancient world had been extinguished together with its belief, the human mind would nev could never, ac except by the intervention of these excitements, have been awakened to the invention of the grosser sciences, sciences and that application of analytical reasoning to the aberrations of society which is now attempted to exalt over the direct expression of the inventive and creative faculty itself. We have, more, we have more moral, political, and historical wisdom than we know how to reduce to, to into practice. We have more scientific and economical knowledge than can be accommodated to the just distribution of the produce which it multiplies. The poetry in these systems of thought is concealed by the accumulation of the facts and calculating processes. There is no want of knowledge respecting what is wisest and best in morals, government and political economy, or at least 
what is wiser and better than what men now practice and endure. But we let, I dare not wait upon I would, like the poor cat in the adage, we want the creative faculty to imagine that which we know, we want the generous impulse to act that which we have, that which we imagine. We want the poetry of life or calculations have outrun concept, conception. We have eaten more than we can digest. The cultivation of those sciences which have enlarged the limits of the empire of man over the external world has, for want of the poetical faculty, proportionally circumscribed those of the etern internal world and man, having enslaved the elements, remains himself a slave. To what but a cultivation of the mechanical arts in a degree dis disproportioned to the presence of the creative faculty, which is the basis of all knowledge, which is the basis of all knowledge, is to be attributed the abuse of all invention for abridging and combining labor to the exasperation of the inequality of mankind? From what other cause has it arisen that the discoveries which should have lightened have added a weight to the curse imposed on Adam? Poetry and the principle of self, of which money is the visible incarnation, are the god and mammon of the world. Somebody want to say something? Yes, uh, I find the last sentence very strange, okay? Uh, poetry and the principle of self, of which money is the visible incarnation, the god mammon of the world. Uh, huh. I would have said the absence of poetry or the of the poetical principle. Uh, yeah. Matt, uh, you you're on mute. I'm on mute. Okay, now I hear yeah. you. Okay, I agree with you entirely, and I think he was playing with us a little bit because he had just been playing the whole, this whole time about people's fixation with words. And, the, and losing the thoughts or the context in that shape a word. And then all of a sudden, for him to say what he just said seems to run contrary to everything that he had been saying up until now. Um, and I agree, like, you yeah. would say the absence of poetry or the, and I, I guess he, from my standpoint, it's like, he's obviously now shifting gears in his, in how he's using the word in the, in regards to the current society's decay that, that he's living in, in terms of the mechanical arts outpacing the creative of vitality, which he's saying the creative vitality has to always outpace the mechanical technological inventiveness, you know, yes. not the other way around. And, and here we have a major principle of classical education mm. in the sense that the gentleman means what he say and he think what he say and he say what think. Okay, so it's very important that the words truly mean what they mean. <laughs> so um, I, I have to admit, he wa if he wanted to play with word, that kind of play, I have to admit I'm a bit uncomfortable with that. <laughs> it goes to that very foundational um, law of classical education. Well, I mean, I, I, I agree with you, but for me, it's like I'm kind of used to it because I, I read, you know, the Republic a few times. And I know Plato also does that where he like plants a he he trip he like he traps you. He plants these like these tricks for you to like stumble on. And I, I'm used. To, that's sort of what I felt like just happened to me just there. Yeah, um, I think the only way that I can be comfortable with that, that if we have to see it as something alive. And there are traps that he set for to see if his students are attentive or not <laughs> during a class. Yeah. That's, how, that's how Plato bans poetry, right? Because he's, he's sort of speaking to Peacock. It's always good to keep in mind that, that Shelley is speaking to both uh, Thomas Love Peacock, who did yeah. the Four Ages of Poetry, or the Four, yeah, the Four Ages of Poetry, where he's making the point people you know, should become 
relevant philosophers. He's using the example of like the enlightenment philosophers and people should just do that, let go of poetry and, and learn economics uh, or law and be relevant. And so he's talking to that, but he's also talking to uh, the Plato challenge back in the, uh, the Republic where he, Plato says, you know, uh, we unfortunately can't allow poets into our, into our Republic because they will always tend to corrupt the people, corrupt the tastes, make them decadent. And he puts out a little, a little challenge saying, but unless somebody could possibly come and refute us, like we, we you know, he tried these yeah. several arguments, but he leaves it open. There's this like possibility to like, you know, challenge him and, and prove him wrong, which yeah. is, uh, which is nice that he does that. Otherwise it would be a bit yeah. dictatorial. Yeah. But I, I, I try to follow you there, but I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking maybe there's something else uh, or maybe he's uh, he's fooling with us, but there's something uh, like he, he's confounding, putting stuff together that don't necessarily go together. Yeah. Like, you know, he says poetry and the principle of self of, of which, which money is the visible incarnation are the God and mammon of the world. Of the world. And, it, you know, he talks about the inequality of mankind and what is uh lacking uh and you know as rich are are getting richer and poor are getting poorer i think that he, he says that there's a lack of poetry and and principle of self that's that's uh there's a uh, lack of money too people are getting poor <laughs> so like i i think that i'm not sure i'm, I'm just saying Pascal, that Pascal, there's a lack Pascal, of all of these Pascal, uh, forgive me but you you change you change the sentence I know, I know. I, 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 I think that I think that it's precisely for that that he wrote that sentence to see to what extent we are going to be ungentlemanly and to pl to change the sentence. Uh, uh, it's a morality test. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, because uh, uh, and I, I, I go back to what I said. Uh, Five minutes ago, I, I imagine Plato uh, in his class letting his student read that sentence, and nothing happened. No comments, no excitation, and so on. It be it would be a very good trap to, to check if they're truly reading what they read, or if their mind are present or not, or just uh, speaking uh, like robots. The the words, precisely the fact that. Uh, words are not the thoughts if there is not a living understanding of the word. Well, so, it's so great about being able to do this as a group too, right? Where we could just like stop, pause and talk to make, to bring some of this stuff alive. Cause we don't have the full answer exactly a hundred percent, but just doing this little quick little segue itself makes it that much more real and alive. Um, sorry, Jonathan, I saw you were about to say something and I, yeah, I, I thought it meant um the combination of poetry and the idea of using poetry as promotion of self which is really like getting you know self praise or gains and profits which is really part of the whole money the visible incarnation where is the mama of the world where poetry is no longer written or said for the edification of the listener but rather glorification of the self so that's where you could see it tied into the whole mammon of, mammon of this world. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. And he's, he's saying as well in the previous sentence too, that the discoveries which should have lightened, like a discovery is a good, it's intrinsically a good thing. And the effect of applying a discovery is always to lighten the, the burden, right? To increase more justice. However, he's saying like in the real world that he's living in, how often has the opposite happened and instead it's in, it's it's been you know like knowledge has been used for destructive purposes and he's also very aware of the british east india company the british empire's evil so he's looking at around him the, of the misuse of technology to enslave and destroy lives he's like it's doing the very opposite it's creating more more slavery more poverty but it, it's intrinsically a good so how is that happening so like poetry is intrinsically a good too uh, the self is good, but all of these things in that context become uh, are becoming bad for some reason because of this other thing, this mammon yeah. uh, problem. Right. 
Yeah, I, I'm sorry to be stubborn, but uh, <laughs> uh, the Principe of South with a capital S uh, means uh, truth, goodness, and beauty. It's, it's, it doesn't mean uh, selfish, selfishness, okay? Uh, Jonathan, are you from India? No, my ancestors are. I, I from Trinidad, I'm like a two generation immigrant. Yeah. Okay. Okay. They, they came. They uh, came no. on as indentured laborers during the British Empire in Trinidad. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, I, I asked that because of uh, of the word South. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I, was, I, I, uh, I didn't. I did I didn't know that either. Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah. And uh, but anyway, I think that all the uh, all the reflections are good because uh, in the sense that if his intention was to make the group discuss, uh, he was he's successful, okay? Because uh, uh, and so because the way that it has been written, it cannot be, of course words can interpret it okay but the way those words follow one each other's poetry and the principle of self of which money is the visible incarnation and the god and mammon of the world uh definitely i i stop here but i stay stubborn and i i say it, it has to be the absence of poetry and the extinction of the principle of self and blah blah blah. You're you're a good person, I can tell. <laughs> uh, no, I'm simply stubborn. So. <laughs> yeah, well, well, but can I ask? Well, um... In a dictatorship, like like we see uh, nowadays, you know, the individual doesn't really have any space. It's it's all about group think, right? Hmm. Oh, but but here we are in group of open-minded persons. So I have, uh, <laughs> I have, I don't feel any bad feelings when I express myself. I'm sure that the others uh, feel comfortable too. So uh, uh, let not compare ourselves to those groups, please. <laughs> I was just thinking of uh, maybe, maybe uh, some of you have read the Mask of Anarchy. Yeah, which oh. is very good. Uh, you know. When, when you understand what happened at that massacre, what, what happened there, right. uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's um, the, the, the idea of self and, uh, you know, just following a leader or following like what the, the government was doing at the time. Uh, I just think it's very, uh, very interesting. And uh, the poetry is just uh, absolutely. Uh, well, yeah. Well, I think, I think one of the things he's, he's attacking the, the, uh, because you know he, he set up out these two standards of the Enlightenment and the Renaissance thinkers, right? He he very clearly demarcated uh, two different domains um, in the previous pages there, and how one the Enlightenment thinkers definitely lacked a certain uh, principle that was present in in those who he uh, put on the the Renaissance thinker list, and part of the problem of the Enlightenment is it did put human beings into uh, you know basically put logic and empiricism into the as a new religion a secular religion that destroyed people's idea of of a divine uh good loving god and uh that was a destructive force he thinks and so i think from that standpoint this re this religion of self of the enlightenment that was permeating his particular world that he's doing battle with is something he might be taking some shots at there not to think that i mean that self is intrinsically bad or poetry is bad because he thinks obviously it's good, but the, 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 what's happening to it. I agree that the capital letter thing implies a platonic idea and that that's offensive, but at the same time too, he's writing this down, you know, this is, he's writing on paper and with ink and it's tough to say what he intended for a capital letter to be or not. Um, yeah. I thought it was interesting. He didn't really elaborate on the poetry part of the sentence. I mean, because the way I read it, you go, he, he goes into the principle of self and then, he, and then he says of which the money is the visible incarnation. He's talking about, obviously, about the principle of self. And so, but, but he leaves poetry kind of alone there. And so I, and, uh, so, so I don't know if that's, that's what I was just thinking. And it's kind of interesting, interestingly 
worded sentence. It was kind of, I didn't feel like it was, it, there's, there's almost something wrong with the way you worded the sentence in my yeah. mind. Yeah. yeah. I think we all agree that there's something very anomalous and weird and kind of off, <laughs> whether intentional or not, about that sentence. Yeah, um, Jonathan. Yeah. Dr. Dr. Quanley, um, yeah. just the that principle of self could it also be if you like if we read the the previous um, lines it it speaks about um, the the false cultivation where mechanical arts and so forth take the the position of the um, creative faculty it, it talks like it it speaks about um, from what other cause has it arisen that the discoveries which should have lightened, have added weight to the curse imposed on Adam. Um, so could, it, could this line where um, poetry and the principle of self could be looked at from the, the perspective of the previous sentences where it talks about uh, a fake form of poetry or uh, a lesser form of poetry has overtaken the, the true form. So that which should have enlightened is now not doing so. And maybe the principle of self, which is all good and so forth, has been contaminated or, or made obscure by these, by the, what is mentioned in the previous sentences. Yeah, absolutely. I think that if we take uh, all the paragraph, uh, what you said is uh, perfectly legit. Uh, but once again, uh, uh, I like very much to oppose the place of the intellect and the direct vision of intelligence, okay? And when we speak of the self with a capital S or with poetry with a capital P, it's always truth, goodness, and beauty, okay? So we, we go back to the fact that uh, a gentleman gentleman knows what is truth, goodness, and beauty. And when uh, people try to bullshit him, uh, he might be polite and refined and not uh, jump on the people trying to bullshit him. But in his mind, in his heart, in his soul, he knows it's BS. Okay? So, uh, and I am very happy that we have this conversation because uh, I hope in my heart that uh, Shelley wrote that strange sentence to provoke that kind of dis discussion of conversation where we can see that we we all brilliant people here okay we can uh get interpretation with words and so on but i think that that's precisely the lesson the intellect can give you a lot of brilliant bs but it's still bs okay uh, uh truth goodness and beauty uh it's not something from the intellect, but from direct vision of the poetic uh, faculty or the poetic principle precise, precisely. That being said though, you, you say that when uh, um, I, something's capitalized, it kind of invokes like truth, goodness, and beauty, right? So why is mammon capitalized? Uh, mammon is capitalized because it's a it's a proper noun, okay? A mammon cannot be not capitalized, and self can be capitalized or in small s, but a mammon is 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 it is the is the golden veil. And precisely, let's not forget that mammon not only symbolize uh, the the worship of wealth, but also the worship of intellectualism. Okay, because most of the people would uh, uh, associate mammon with uh, the worship of wealth, which is exact, but mammon is also the worship of intellectualism. Hmm. And we go back once again to the dialectic between intellect and intelligence, which is direct vision, and which brings back to the epistemological journey precisely. Good point. Uh, because once, uh, once again, we 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 all brilliant here. We can play with words very easily, okay? And that's and and that's the trap, okay? Of the intellect, you can justify anything with very brilliant BS. 
Well, that, that's where I, I think it's, it's like he's, his whole polemic has been lately, um, including the, the section on uh, Paradise Lost, right? This, um, that the word Lucifer would rightfully, you know, send somebody off. Like, you know, you'd be like, oh, that, that means you're evil because I know what that word means. There's a lot of baggage with the word. But he's like pointing out that in the context, why he likes Milton so much is he's saying like, if, and I've never, I've never read Paradise Lost. I'm embarrassed to say I've got to read it. But it seems to be what he's implying is that when you look at the context and how the character is portrayed within that, that character has, despite the word, all of these virtues and sublime characteristics that we would normally associate with something beautiful and good and true. And the, the character of God, who is normally something we associate with goodness and like we have good feelings as soon as we hear God has all of these attributes within the context of the story that are the opposite of good. And, um, and it's, it's, I think the way I was reading that or how he was appreciating Milton from that context is he was trying to like liberate people from their worship of the, the outward form of the word of just like symbolic language and into a state where they're more like looking at, well, how is a word being used contextually within, you know, which is not very common. Like that's how we're all played like instruments by the empire is, is by getting everybody to like, just think in terms of a crystallized state of this means this. Okay. And, and then, and then we go and move like a mob into some pre designed location, right. Where we destroy ourselves versus thinking through, well, maybe the context is shaping things. So anyway, that that's how I'm seeing the theme. And so for that theme to be so strong in the context of what we've been reading, and then to stumble on such an anomalous choice of words, right? We hear that have caused this whole thing to happen with us as a dialogue. I feel like, I feel like it, it, it must have been intentional. <laughs> of course, of course. To put that splinter there, like the, the woman looking at you behind the, the slab of meat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, because precisely if you have that pr poetic principle where you have direct vision of truth, goodness, and beauty, uh, you cannot be mesmerized by any kind of BS, okay? Uh, and it sounds, uh, if, I, if I was in a, in a modern group, uh, people would have said that I, 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 I offer an authoritarian perspective, okay? But it's not authoritarian. Because if you, you are living the poetic principle where you have direct vision of truth, goodness, and beauty, you can simply, you see the truth and you cannot be hypnotized by BS. Uh, it's the truth, it's not authoritarian. I recently had uh, an exchange with somebody uh, where I got to formulate some things, but I, I like quant, like legalism, right? or in the West, nominalism, right? Or just generally formalism, that's always ripe for decay because it's always assuming that there are these fixed definitions, but it's based on, it's predetermined, right? So there's not much nuance. It's like, we're just saying, as long as something checks off the boxes, uh, you know, and people go through the motions, this can be like in, in religion, this can be in morality, you know, like the person saying the right things and doing the right things or technically follow the rules. Uh, that's always a source of corruption. And I mean, we have that in any system uh, and any culture, right? I think in, in the more Asiatic, uh, you know, world, it would be like legalism. That can be it. In the West, we have nominalism and there's good nominalists, right? Like in the sense people can use that method and reason and make good points. I mean, I've seen it done. It's not all bad, but the form is itself, uh, that's, it's the problem. It's the approach, right? Like you can say things that are true, even though you're not necessarily taking the best approach. I mean, that happens all the time, but I guess the, if we just get stuck on definitions, the moron will not be able to think <laughs> as freely as the person who is, you know, sage and, and does the same thing. I guess I, I, I feel like that's, um, that's where people get lost, right? We have like the, the gentleman, right? You say, we'll use the words correctly, but then in, you know, the hands of somebody who's less 
learn, they're saying the same things, but they don't have a sense of the meaning. And that I feel like that's always a source of corruption, whether it's East or West or anywhere. You said something that prompted me to say that, something with words and using the words. Uh... Yeah, I wanted to retract myself <laughs> in a sense, sorry. Uh, but because um, he says poetry and the principle of self of which money is the visible incarnation are the god and mammon of the world, right? So poetry is the god, and the principle of self is mammon. And the way I'm reading it now. Yeah, self-expressed right? or incarnated as money is the visible form of this idea of self. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, that's it. So it's oh, contrasting, it's contrasting both. I, I thought, for a beginning that you know the principle of self would have been a good thing uh in his time but then yeah as i'm reflecting as as you said i, I was thinking maybe uh, i was i had this idea of you remember uh when uh, uh benjamin franklin was helping building the uh the uh the manufacturers you know the canals and all of this in england but then again, yeah, the uh, the East India Company, uh, you know, got into this and, and the whole, you know, good things. Uh, what could have been really good things for people in England uh, became just uh, tools of oppression. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep, yep. I think next week what we could do is read uh, Mask of Anarchy because I'm I think that this has been such a fruitful conversation at this one point of anomaly that it's probably we're reaching 10 p.m. a good place to end. And then next week, we'll just read the last 25 pages and include a poem. And that Mask of Anarchy poem is a fun one that he wrote the same year, or the, the I think eight months earlier before writing this essay, um, which is just a, an incredible intervention um, into the the injustice of Castlereagh, the, the people who are managing the and organizing the the Congress of Vienna, one of the most evil moments in world recent world history, which which Kissinger, <laughs> none other than Henry Kissinger himself, has said is his most his favorite uh, moment of world history, the the source of his first book that was published, uh, which is fascinating. So yeah, let's do that uh, next week. What do you guys think? Yeah, good. Cool. 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 Good. Great. All right. Good. So this is uh, some fruitful mind food for tonight. Thank you all for uh, this feast. Appreciate it. <laughs> and uh, I'll catch you all. I will, Martin Seif is doing the class this Sunday on how the British created and destroyed George Orwell, which should be very interesting at uh, probably 2 p.m. And then we'll, we'll do this again next, uh, next Wednesday. All right. Okay. All right. That's the way go. Thank you very much. So happy everyone. Easter. Thank happy Easter, guys. Yes. Bye. Thanks, guys. Happy Easter. Bye bye.